Today, we have the pleasure to welcome Phyllis Gerib as the guest speaker in our seminar series uh, in analytical sociology. Phyllis is a professor of sociology and public affairs at the Department of Sociology at Princeton University. She has a PhD in sociology also from Princeton, uh, so she's back at her alma mater. And prior to her current position, she was a faculty at Harvard and, and Cornell. And her research lies at the intersection of migration, economic sociology, and inequality. And if I may, as a true analytical sociologist in her research, she also focuses on understanding the mechanisms that enable or constrain mobility, which then kind of leads to greater or lesser <clears throat> degrees of social and economic uh, inequality. She has published in various prestigious journals, such as the American jo uh, Journal of Sociology, Demography, Annual Review of Sociology, Social Forces, PNAS, and Nature, among others. And uh, her book on the move, uh, Changing Mechanisms of uh, Mexico-US Migration has won four best uh, book awards. And today she'll be talking about networks, diffusion and inequality. And uh, before giving the floor to Phyllis, I would like to thank everyone for joining today's seminar. And would like to remind everyone to please keep the microphones turned off during the seminar. Uh, please will accept um, clarification questions as we go along. But also, please note that we will have enough time to discuss more detailed questions after the seminar as well. Uh, so without further ado, uh, it is a great pleasure to have you with us today, Phyllis. Uh, the screen is all yours. Thank you so much. Can everyone hear me, see the screen? No technology yes. issues? So yes. thank you for the kind introduction, Saljan. It's actually great to have someone who pronounces my name perfectly. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. <laughs> um, so um, this is, um, I'm going to be presenting two papers, and one of them uh, was recently published with Linda Zhao, and then the other one uh, should have been published maybe kind of two years ago, but we're still kind of in the writing stage with Flavian Gantar. And Flavian is now a PhD student at Columbia. And then Linda was a postdoc at Cornell, but she's starting in the sociology department in Chicago next year. So basically um, with Linda, we're trying to develop uh, the theory with a computational model. And then in the second part of the presentation, I'm gonna talk about some empirical results where we test the implications of that theory with data on Mexico, US migration. And again, as Saljan said, I'm happy to take questions during. So our starting point in this project is a very simple idea. So we know that social networks provide access to resources. Then any process that shapes network formation will have implications for inequality. And we took off from the starting point in our earlier work with Paul DiMaggio. And there we focused on homophily, a particular mechanism, which is the tendency for people to associate with similar others. And we argued that homophily leads to segregated networks, and these networks eventually create intergroup inequality in outcomes for which our alters offer a positive influence. So let's consider the case of internet adoption. That was our focus in the paper. And in the United States, there's still a racial gap in subscriptions to home internet service. So whites are more likely to have internet at home compared to African-Americans. And the difference uh, is sustained even if we account for income, education, occupation differences between the two groups. So we set out to explain basically what underlies this intergroup inequality. And we first noted that some people have an initial advantage when it comes to these uh, adopting new technologies. So those with higher education, those with higher income are both likely to know about the technology better and they also are able to afford it. So in the US context, this group of advantaged individuals are also predominantly white. So second thing we noted was homophily, as we know from vast empirical work, leads to networks that are clustered by the same characteristics that are related to adapting new technologies. So this means that we tend to be connected to people who are similar to us in terms of education, income, and often race. So third idea was that technologies like internet are special because they carry what we call network externalities. That is, they become more valuable to us the more people in our own network adopt. For example, if most of my friends are using email or most of them are on Facebook, I have a lot of reason to join or to get internet service at home. But if I have only a few friends who are using these technologies, then the incentives are lower. So the value of the technology depends on how many of my friends are already using it. 
So we argue that under these conditions, when there is an initial gap in adoption by status, when there's also homophily by status characteristics, and when the practice or technology in question is subject to network externalities, we argued that social networks would lead to surplus inequality that cannot be attributed to status differences alone. In other words, networks would make inequality worse. So we showed this process using an agent-based model. And as many of you know, these models typically rely on synthetic like made up agents, and we can give them different attributes, different rules for associating with one another, and then different rules for behavior. And then we can simulate a social world by letting people interact, these agents interact with one another, and then we observe the macro level patterns that emerge. So in our paper, we actually diverged from the strategy. We did not create synthetic agents, but instead we sampled real individuals surveyed by the general social survey. And um, so we wanted to be, at the time, we wanted to be able to say something about the digital divide in the US. And for that, we needed to first replicate the population structure as closely as possible. So basically, we wanted to capture the correlations between income, education, and race um, in the US context. And as I will kind of discuss in a minute, this choice had implications for what we could study and what we had to leave out. So basically, the earlier paper with Paul forms a starting point uh, for the work that I'll present today. So in that paper, our argument had this kind of logic that you're seeing on the slide. We argued that there is a mechanism, homophily, that shapes network structure. That structure influences the diffusion of a practice and also inequality in the diffusion of that practice across groups. But homophily is not the only mechanism that can shape network structure. So in our, in our paper with Linda, we introduced another parameter that we think is key to network formation. And this parameter is consolidation. So consolidation is the correlation between characteristic and population. So if a society is highly consolidated, if I know your income, I can easily guess everything else about you, like your education, your race, your residential neighborhood, because these characteristics are highly correlated. So in our paper with Paul, we could not consider consolidation because it was fixed in the data. And our agents came from the GSS, the General Social Survey. So the correlations between these different characteristics like income and education basically matched the correlations in the US population at large. It wasn't something that we could manipulate. But in fact, the concept of consolidation features prominently in classical work like Blau and Schwartz cross-cutting social circles. So in that book, uh, Blau and Schwartz argue that low homophily and low consolidation are necessary to generate cross-cutting social ties and ultimately social cohesion in a community. And they have a straightforward logic there. So if I don't select my friends based on how similar they are to me, then I'll be likely to connect to a diverse group of people. Also, if different traits in my community are not correlated, that is, if I can run into you in our neighborhood bar, even if I don't make as much money as you do, then again, I'm likely to have a diverse set of friends. And if everyone in a community has these diverse ties, then the community will likely be cohesive. Now, researchers after that, mostly Blau students, tested some of these claims. For example, studies found that low homophily and low consolidation were, would lead to higher rates of interracial marriages in communities and also associated with higher frequency of intergroup interactions in organizations. But if you think about it, this evidence concerns the first part of Blau and Schwartz's claim. And that part is homophily and consolidation are shaping the extent of cross-cutting social ties, or more generally, the network structure. What about the second part? So in the recent paper, Damon Santola considered this kind of second link in the chain. So whether these parameters also shape social cohesion. And Santola defined social cohesion in a very particular way as the diffusion of a common practice or norm. Do we all go by the same rules in society? And to study these links, the whole kind of chain of events that we're seeing here, he used an agent-based model. So again, he created synthetic agents with particular attributes. And this way, he manipulated consolidation. For example, in one scenario, the attributes can be assigned randomly. In another scenario, being high in one attribute, like education, means you're high in other attributes, like occupation. So then Santola gave these agents rules for associating with one another. And this way he controlled homophily. Again, in one scenario, you can imagine each agent selecting their ties randomly. In a different scenario, agents can choose people who are like themselves. 
And he found that the network structure can look very different under these different uh, levels of these parameters. Parameters. And here kind of we replicated his first result in the paper. In the upper left panel, we see a network graph when homophily and consolidation are both low. So as Blau and Schwartz would expect, the network here is one giant component. So everyone is connected to everyone else. So everyone can be reached from every other node. There are no visible cliques or subgroups here. Um, and this is a case where your characteristics are randomly distributed, so your education does not determine your income or occupation. This is the low consolidation condition. And ties are also established randomly among people. Now, let's go down the diagonal. When homophily and consolidation are at middling levels, we see the network begin to split into islands. So individuals in each island or subgroup are densely connected, but then they're largely separated from those in the other groups. And then if we keep kind of going down the diagonal, when we bring homophily and consolidation to high levels, then the network splits even more. So now these groups or islands are smaller, the connections among them or within these islands are denser, but then the connections across islands are actually sparser. So this is all in line with Blau and Schwartz. So the lower the level of homophily and consolidation, the higher the levels of interconnectivity in the population. But there are also other patterns that Blau and Schwartz could not anticipate that we're learning from this simulation exercise. We first see that homophily and consolidation are not independent in their effects on the network structure. So if we look at this kind of upper uh, row, when homophily is low, as in the upper panel A, uh, A, B, and C, increasing consolidation alone does not seem to make much of a difference. In other words, even if we kind of max out on consolidation, we still see kind of one giant component. Similarly, when consolidation is kept fixed at a low level, increasing homophily has little effect. We see some separation, but not as much as in other cases. So basically, we see that homophily and consolidation actually interact in their effect on the network structure. Now, Let's kind of move on to the social cohesion piece. Once kind of we figure out how homophily and consolidation are shaping network structure, then we ask, how is this network structure translating into diffusion processes? So here he's um, considering a diffusion of a, a common practice. And when he's doing that, he is giving agents particular rules for adopting the practice. So again, this is something that we can manipulate. We can change the rules of adoption. So in one case, you can say that an agent will adopt if one person in her network adopts, and that's kind of the threshold. In different, and then you can uh, try out different scenarios where you increase that threshold to two people, three people, and then just kind of look at the patterns, how the diffusion outcomes change. And he discovered an interesting pattern. So he found that when the diffusion process is simple, and the definition of a simple diffusion process or a simple contagion is all it takes is one person in your network for you to kind of adopt the practice or one adopter. And when the diffusion process is like that, um, a simple contagion, then we see that low consolidation and low homophily, so the giant connected network, leads to the most successful diffusion. But when we make the diffusion process more complex, that is, let's say you need two or more people to adopt first for you to adopt yourself, then we actually see medium consolidation and medium homophily leading to the most successful diffusion. So if we unpack the logic here, if we, it's a simple diffusion, here one person telling you about a technology is enough for you to go ahead and adopt it. In this case, a well-connected network actually helps population level diffusion of a practice. And as we saw in the slide with the network graphs, low homophily and low consolidation are helpful in connecting individuals and creating this one giant component where everyone is reachable from every other node. But let's consider complex contagion where you need more reinforcement to subscribe to an idea. And migration is actually a good example here. If you hear information from a random person about opportunities in the US, maybe that's not enough for you to go ahead and try to cross the border without documents. But if multiple people in your network give you the same information, then uh, you become more likely to uh, subscribe to the same idea. So this means that you need some concentration of adoption in your network. 
And for that to happen, a random population structure is not really helpful. You basically need some overlapping ties in your network. So basically you need some concentration of migrants or adopters in your network. And that happens under conditions of medium homophily and medium consolidation. Now, this figure is a replication of the, his study, and then we're going to kind of vary things in that. So the figure on the z-axis, we're seeing uh, diffusion, and we're defining diffusion as a complex diffusion, so you need two or more people to adapt. And then on the x and y axes, we see different levels of homophily and consolidation, and we see the diffusion plane is highest when homophily and consolidation are at middling levels. And um, another thing that we see in this graph is that the effects are not necessarily linear. And both homophily and consolidation have nonlinear effects on diffusion. And then they also interact. The value of one determines how the value of the other will um, affect diffusion process. Okay, at very low levels, we see that in the, where the red arrow is pointing to, there is no diffusion. And this is directly countering the Blau and Schwartz claim. Also at very high levels of homophily and consolidation, we have low diffusion. And then at the, at the middling levels that we observe the most successful diffusion. Okay, so basically the takeaway here is successful diffusion is happening when there's some internal structure to the network, like we see in this kind of, um, the network graph in the uh, green rectangle. Um, we need some balkanization happening, but we also need many ties um, connecting across. So if we go down the diagonal to I, then the connections across islands are too loose. So there's a happy medium between um, the kind of very low and very high cases. Okay, so what does this all mean for inequality? So this is our starting point with Linda. Okay, so if we go back to this initial logic, in our paper with Paul, we're we were thinking about how homophily is related to network structure, how that feeds into diffusion and eventually inequality. We did not consider consolidation there, that was fixed in the data. So when we look at Santola's work, we see he is considering consolidation, but his concern is not with inequality, but overall diffusion. So basically we're combining these two ideas here and we use an agent-based model like Santola. We introduce status differences among individuals and we assume that your status affects adoption probability. So we're bringing this key idea from uh, our paper with Paul into the Santola framework. And we're assuming that high status individuals will start adoption first. And then we wanna see how different network structures would lead to different levels of inequality. Okay. And our key parameters are homophily and consolidation. And then we are kind of varying these, these uh, parameters systematically. We're not empirically calibrating this model, unlike in the paper with Paul. So we wanna see all possibilities out there and we're tracking the adoption levels uh, for different status groups. So yes, happy to take it. Thank you, Felice, for that. Um, those slides, amazing. So one clarification question about the data. So for, for these studies that you have showed us, are we using the same data? Some of them are simulations, you said. So can you just talk about the differences Absolutely. in terms of in terms Absolutely. that? Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Adele. So in the first paper, it's a highly, it's an, both are agent-based models, right? In the first one, it's highly calibrated to the empirical setting. So we basically draw our agents from the GSS, General Social Survey, and this data has income, education, race, and also number of network ties each person has. So that information comes from existing people, existing data. So then the, 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 the kind of simulation becomes basically how do we connect these people across to one another? Uh, under different scenarios of homophily. And then we also, when designing the rules of internet adoption, again, it's like we have this formal model of like how the price changes as a, as a uh, in relation to number of adopters in the network. What is your rule? Uh, you know, the homophily is different. Like how do people gauge how similar they are to one another? Uh, basically, we think that income, education, and race are equally important and we kind of compute social distances and then select under different homophily scenarios we're selecting it's that. So it's very much calibrated and very much constrained to that setting. Now, Santola lies on the opposite end of like agent-based modelers. He's all about non-calibrated, completely synthetic, all possibilities of the world. And let's see kind of theoretically how things might work out without kind of constraining it to an empirical setting. And with Linda, 
we're basically following the Santola track. And then we're saying, okay, we're gonna replicate the exact model that he has that I'm gonna describe now. And we're not empirically calibrating at all. So if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. So now comes the leading question, which is that, you know, where, where do you think in terms of putting a proof of, um, the weight of the proof, basically, in terms of your argument that you've listed. So, which of them do you you think is, is sort of more um, yeah. worthy of, of 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 emphasizing? Yeah. So, I I mean, I like Santolo's work a lot, and in that paper, um, it, it was published in the AJS in 2015. It doesn't have uh, an empirical component in the sense that he doesn't test the ideas. It's just like a theory building exercise. And I think it's interesting because Blau and Schwartz argument, for example, makes a lot of sense, you know, when they say low homophily and low consolidation should be the best. But then through the simulation, you see that there are other worlds that could emerge where that is not the case. So I think for that theoretical argument, his strategy is perfect. I personally, uh, you know, uh, like to be able to test the implications later. And that's why here in this talk, I'm combining two papers. Basically, we develop some implications here and then we want to be able to test some of them on data. I think empirically calibrated and agent-based modeling is hard to pull off uh, because, you know, again, you want to, the advantage of agent-based models is you want to fix certain things that you don't, like you create this experimental condition. Um, in that way. And then, you know, empirical calibration means that you need to pick the things that matter the most. And sometimes it's hard to pick those things. It's hard to know how to calibrate, but some people do it successfully. There's a group um, in, in, at the University of North Carolina who've used this successfully, uh, like very complex agent-based models where there's fertility, mortality, migration, things happening to people over time. So all calibrated to real life patterns and they do it really, really well. Uh, but I think I, I don't know kind of where I fall. I think it depends on the question is my short answer. Great. Thank you, please. Yeah. Any other questions, thoughts? No. Okay. So let me continue. This part of the talk is a bit kind of boring, but I'll kind of try to go quickly. Um, so basically this is how our, uh, algorithm, the, the agent-based model works. So we basically start by setting the homophily, the level of homophily and consolidation. Here's kind of how we kind of think about uh, our population of agents. And this actually builds on a paper by Watts, Dodd, and Newman. And Santola took that model and applied to his case. So basically here, individuals form groups based on shared characteristics. So here we see six dots, which are six individuals, and they're all in a circle um, in the same group. So which means that they're sharing a characteristic. And we can imagine that these groups can be organized hierarchically into different levels. So let's say that at the first level, we have eight groups. And then level two is four groups. Here, each group includes two circles. And then level, um, level three uh, includes two larger groups. And then level four is everyone. Now, note that in each level, our tree is branching into two. And then we can imagine that uh, this figure shows the hierarchy, let's say, in occupation. So let's say that four circles on the left represent management and right four circles show workers. So the top branch in our tree is referring to the distinctions between management and workers. Um, and then the second branching point within management can define finer distinctions. For example, between managers, we can think about executives and middle management. Now, we use this tree-like structure to define social distance between people. So we assume that individuals in the same group are at a distance of one. So that's the minimum distance that you can have. And then for everyone else, sorry, I, okay, okay. So for everyone else, the distance equals one plus the number of steps it takes to reach a common route. So, so let's imagine that we're considering cases I and J. So these are the gray circles in the two, um, two kind of bigger circles. And um, the distance between them is one plus the two steps it takes to reach that common root in the tree. So basically homophily parameter that we're setting is setting the search radius and establishing ties. If homophily is very high, then my search radius is very small. It could be one, which means that I'm only looking at my own circle to look for friends. If homophily is low, it means that my search radius is high. So I, anybody can be my friend. So that's how we're manipulating it. 
Now, how do we define consolidation? We use the same logic. The figure that we saw with that tree was a single dimension, let's say kind of occupation. We can imagine there are multiple dimensions like education, one's residential neighborhood. And here I'm showing two trees, let's say kind of one is occupation, one is education. And we're representing each of these with a tree and then we're defining distance in a symmetric way across dimensions. So um, the distance equals again, one plus the number of steps it takes up the branching tree to find a common ancestor if the two trees were superimposed on one another. So let's say that individual I here in the left most circle in dimension one, and uh, the same individual is in the middle circle in the second dimension. Um, so the distance between the two dimensions, this person's let's say income and education is again, one plus the number of steps it takes, it's three. So if consolidate, yes. I'm sorry to interrupt. Nope. Um, we see your software update Oh, thingy on the screen. No, thank if you could you. just cancel that. Yeah, I have two that. screens. That's why I didn't see that. Yeah, Thanks. yeah, I, I, I guess so. So, but, but that comes like on the. Okay, thank you so on much. On the screen that we see. Asking for my password. Sorry. Okay. It's okay, right? Yes, it's perfect. Thank you very much. Sorry to interrupt. Okay. Oops. Now we don't have the screen. Yes, I think it. Give me one second, please. Yeah, of course. Let me see if I can fix that. Okay. You I lose my one. Yes. So you lose my screen for one second because sorry, I'll be right back. Okay. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> sorry, I couldn't find another way of doing that. Okay, let's see. Okay. All right, are we back on? Yes, perfect. Thank okay. you very much. I, I apologize for that. Any other questions now that we've taken this break? No? Okay, so basically the consolidation parameter is using the structure to, to define how far you can be, a single individual can be in terms of her social positions across dimensions. So if consolidation is very high, then if I'm in a low education position, um, then I can only hold a low level occupation. If consolidation is low, even if I have low education, I can still have a high status occupation. So again, kind of there's a symmetry between how these things are defined. So basically, if we go back to our algorithm, we set the level of homophily and consolidation first, and we use the tree-like structures that I just showed you to assign individuals to groups in each social dimension based on consolidation. So when we first fix consolidation, we assign individuals to groups in different social dimensions, and then we need to kind of make ties between them. And then for that, we're using the homophily uh, parameter. The this is all similar to Santola, but one innovation that we make is that we take one dimension to designate status. And we assume that there are three different status groups, high, medium, and low. And importantly, we make the adoption threshold an inverse status, uh, inverse function of your status. So if you're a high status person, let's say all it takes for you to adopt the practice is having one person in your network. If you're a medium status person, maybe you need two people. If you're a low status person, you need three people. So that way we're introducing initial inequality in the adoption where some people will be more likely to, de to be the first adopters. Now, then once the setup is done, we focus on our key outcome, the diffusion of a common practice and the inequality in that diffusion across different status groups. So to observe the outcome, we set the initial seed, which is a random high status individual and their immediate social ties. Okay, first question that we wanna ask is, can we replicate the Santola results with the, the, the setting where we introduce some inequality? When we look at overall diffusion levels, we see that we can replicate pretty much the same pattern that Santola had. So remember that he had a fixed adopt adoption threshold for everyone. There was no differentiation between groups. When we introduce this kind of differentiation, we still get the same overall diffusion level here. Now the figures kind of look a bit different. The ranges are different. Uh, the, 
I apologize for that, but kind of take my word. If we were to kind of do the, make them more similar, they would look even more similar here. Okay, so how about kind of our earlier work with Paul, uh, where we fixed consolidation? Okay, so this is kind of a different type of uh, graph. So let me kind of walk you through it. So basically, the y-axis here is showing the proportion of adopters uh, or diffusion, and the x-axis is showing time. And each of the curves that you see here are showing you different levels of homophily. And the highest level of homophily is the curve, the S-curve with the dark uh, dots, the black dots. And then the other ones have lower and lower levels of homophily. So, and remember here, we only modified homophily. We didn't have a consolidation parameter. So basically what we observed in this plot and what we, the conclusion we draw was as we increase homophily, adoption gets faster at first. So the highly advantageous people are highly connected to one another under high homophily. So you can imagine the process, the um, practice diffusing really fast in a particular group. So the diffusion is very rapid, but then the diffusion cannot jump to other groups of people because they're so loosely connected across under high homophily. So the overall level of diffusion, the equilibrium level is lower. So faster at first, but the level is lower. Now, based on this result, Paul and I concluded that homophily hurts adoption. Now, in our um, results with Linda, we see the same pattern, but we also have to qualify it. We see that it only applies to high consolidation cases. So again, if we look at the three-dimensional figure, we see the plane going down, the diffusion plane going down with homophily only at low levels of consolidation. Only at, I'm sorry, only at high levels of consolidation. Now, we could not see this pattern with Paul because our sample came from one setting and it's a highly consolidated US setting where your income, education, and race are highly, highly correlated. We also could not see in that work that homophily can actually help diffusion under certain circumstances. In other words, there are cases that having some homophily is better than having no homophily for diffusion. Especially when consolidation is low, having a lot of homophily is better than having little of it. So this is the counterintuitive finding that emerges from uh, this result. Now, what about inequality? Again, if we go back to our earlier work with Paul, the figure we're seeing here is the odds ratios of adoption between high income and low income people. So basically the higher this ratio, the higher the inequality by income in adopting a practice. And again, we're showing the process of diffusion over time in our model. So the x-axis is time, y-axis is odds ratio, and then the different curves are corresponding to different levels of um, homophily. And uh, if you look at the equilibrium levels, the highest homophily levels lead to the highest difference by income. So again, based on that, we argue that inequality increases with homophily. Now, again, with Linda, we are qualifying that and we're saying that, yes, that happens, but only under high consolidation. So here we kind of replicated the same, we generated a similar figure of odds ratios of adoption by status over time. And then we see that high homophily and medium homophily cases are indistinguishable. So the two lines are completely overlapping and the inequality is higher under those circumstances. And then it's lower when homophily is low. But this only applies when consolidation is fixed at a high level. What happens when we look at low consolidation cases? We actually see the opposite pattern. Here we see that low homophily, the red line, actually leads to higher inequality than medium or high homophily. Again, it's a surprising pattern that high homophily worlds can lead to lower inequality than medium and low homophily bonds. And again, we could not observe this with Paul because we had fixed consolidation and had not even considered it. And in some cases here, we can see that inequality is decreasing with homophily. Now, what's the intuition behind these counterintuitive findings. Again, if we go back to the beginning, to Santola's original results, when a diffusion process is complex, that is you need reinforcement from multiple people to adopt the practice, then networks with overlapping ties are ideal. 
And those networks occur at middling levels of homophily and consolidation, like we saw in this figure. In other words, homophily and consolidation can help diffusion and homophily can help even disadvantaged people adopt faster when consolidation is low, because homophily is giving the network this structure that is ideal, creating these overlapping ties that is ideal for complex diffusion. And as a result, homophily can reduce inequality. And again, it's like pointing to the same figure when consolidation is low, homophily is actually quite helpful in connecting people and in fully diffusing a practice. As we see in this region, when consolidation is very low, increasing homophily at first is actually helpful to diffuse. And it's precisely in this region that we see the inequality reduction happening. Now, uh, this is actually related to Adele's uh, point. Um, now that we have this nice model, interesting results, counterintuitive results, this is all things that agent-based models love when you get something unexpected and you can write about it. It's something that you could not have deduced by just kind of thinking about it. But when you let agents interact, some kind of macro level pattern emerges that surprises you and you learn something from it. But can we use these insights in the real world? So I'm happy to stop here and maybe take a few questions if there are any, or then, or I can move, I'll probably be done in like 10 minutes or so. Okay, so um, there, oh. there is a question, yeah. Philip. Yes, Milena. Sorry, just wanted to start my video. Um, hi. So, so what you so the assumption you make here regarding inequality is that uh, what is to be diffused is beneficial. Absolutely. Have you thought about the opposite of where, for example, talking about you know drug abuse or uh, you know some kind of violent behavior or something like that, uh, okay. where uh, have you explored this basically in the model? Right, right, right. No, I think in, there would be some cases where the results would be symmetric, right? So if, if let's say kind of if advantage is inverted, if low advantaged people, people experiencing economic difficulty are more likely to use these substances and then those people are more likely to connect be connected to other people like them because of the occupational structure or something like that, you could see some of these kind of basically flipped things um, happening, but then there could be other more complex cases, right, where basically the, um, the things that make, um, you know, uh, the dimensions along which homophily occurs, and here it's like income, education, you know, race, we said, do not necessarily correspond to the things that matter to adoption. So I, you know, since we haven't done that, I don't want to kind of extrapolate, but in, I think I can see some cases where this being kind of symmetric and other cases, maybe, maybe not. But that's a huge assumption that we're making, that the practice is beneficial, right? And then the other thing is the things that matter to adoption are the things that matter to network formation. So those are the sco scope conditions here. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah. We have uh, two more questions before you move on, uh, Samuel and then Adele. Hi, Phyllis. Thank you for the very nice first part of this talk. Uh, my question is, uh, I have seen that you compare the results of the um, uh, of a completely synthetic model, like the, the uh, one uh, by Santola that is already also used, and then um, that you compare that with, uh, I guess that it's a model that is very much based on empirical distribution of, of the population, right? So have you, uh, I don't know, I don't know if calibrated or fitted or at least compared somehow if the model describes well uh, your empirical distribution of population like, or, or maybe the links between the different social groups or something like that, just to be sure that this model is adequate for this kind of study. Yeah, um, we, we haven't done that. And it's, you know, we thought about like how to do that. So initially, uh, actually, when we started out with Paul, we did not want to kind of draw the sample, like we did not even think to draw the sample from, you know, the GSS. Um, but it was very hard to represent the joint distributions of income, education, and race. Like education is kind of, it has these peaks across along degrees, and then income is kind of, uh, you know, uh, log normal. So it's like initially we did, um, we could not kind of figure out a way of doing that kind of systematically. That's why we went for it. But then we didn't really 
see how the Santola model would correspond into to kind of the real life distributions there. Because I think with Linda, we had disconnected ourselves from the question of like a, a particular population, the US population or internet adoption. So, you know, we didn't, but if you have any examples of papers who've done this kind of work where kind of um, you match some aspects of the model to, um, you know, to the the synthetic model that you're creating, I would love to see it. I think some people do it uh, successfully. Again, in the um, the examples that I know of, for example, demographers at UNC, they again use the real life population. They use a real life survey data, and then they have real parameters on fertility patterns, mortality patterns, and all that. And then they're creating these models perfectly calibrated to that, to existing data. And then they kind of tested on another portion of the data to say that like, okay, so if we fit it to, let's say from 1980 to 2000, we wanna make sure that it can explain 2000 to 2005. It's almost like training testing type thing. And then they use it to make projections. But here it's kind of, we don't have that kind of an empirical setup. So um, anyway, if you have any examples, please send them my way. If you have any thoughts, I would also love to hear them now. Yeah, I mean, it's always extremely difficult and it's like the, I don't know, the golden standard, right, of a model if you actually can do yeah. this, but uh, yeah. <laughs> no, thank <laughs> not, you. Not, no, I appreciate not, it. No, I know. It's like I don't have a resolution and I'm not happy yeah. with that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Phyllis. Uh, could you please go back? I think it was one or two slides uh, when you compared the another one, another one, just one more, where you had the graph with the odds ratios. That, there we go. So um, I was trying to interpret the different, um, so the odds ratios on the left side seems to be quite small compared to the right-hand side odds ratios. So are they fully comparable or doing different things, first of all? No, 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 very different, very different. Yeah. So. Uh, basically, uh, one is kind of fully synthetic. The left-hand side is fully synthetic. The right-hand side is using real incomes of people and you know, it, it, it completely calibrated case. So the odds ratios there are kind of uh, wacky because our, we have this, anyway, this is kind of a bit in the weeds, but we have this multiplicative model that very quickly diffuses things among people at first. Mm -hmm. So in the initial period, imagine that there are two groups and then let's say three rich people have migrate, have um, adopted and nobody have in the other group have it. So it's like, it's, it just gets wacky in the first and then eventually it stabilizes, but it's not com comparable. I think it's kind of related right. to the earlier question. There's yeah. no way of comparing these things, but then the shapes, the overall shapes are similar. And, and then what I'm most interested in is like the equilibrium level. Right. Uh, differences, yeah. yeah. That makes sense. So my, my other question was, but then if they're not comparable, perhaps my question doesn't apply, which is that, you know, how does the difference uh, account into, like, how much of this difference is arising due to sampling variability and modeling variability? But then it's because you have different models, different data, synthetic doesn't apply. Exactly. So, yeah. I think one thing that I thought about, but, you know, I don't know how much of my time I want to bury into kind of this, this project, but one thing that I thought about with Paul was maybe kind of we could go back to that. And then one way of kind of um, varying consolidation with this real life population is basically redistribute attributes, right? So we know like you come with a vector of, you know, income, education, race, and uh, network ties, but then we could just kind of... Um, distribute your occupation to someone else. And, you know, so we could kind of uh, modify consolidation in that way. We could make them unrelated. They're correlated right now in the data, but we yeah. could break that correlation by yeah. randomly, like imagine that you have a pool of occupation statistics that everybody's randomly getting one. So we yeah. thought about yeah. doing that, but we're also kind of both done with this project. I don't know like how much <laughs> we want to go there, but that that would be one way of kind of making these a little bit more comparable. Right, it's only like a counterfactual analysis in a way, maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe even approaching causality. That was my question for the end. We'll call exactly. causal questions, but we'll save it for later. No, exactly. And you know, Linda now, Linda's whole dissertation is about consolidation using different data sources. And she's using European data. Um, the SILS for EU data, the children of immigrants longitudinal study, and they have network data. And she's done a lot of kind of cool work with this consolidation idea, but not using agent-based models. But I think that's going to be her main thing going forward. 
a tiny question about the x-axis of time here. Uh, so what scale are we talking about in a human, human scale? What is it, months, years, or what, what are you talking about? So roughly months, we're thinking. Right, on, the right. left, on, the, on, the, on the right hand side, because we calibrated it to real life price changes of the internet, adoption things. So we were trying to match real life adoption. So roughly a month. Okay. On the left hand side, no idea. It's like <laughs> totally synthetic, yes. Okay, it could be light years, could be months. I know, I know. <laughs> Hopefully not that. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. Okay. So let's go. Okay. So this is the part where Flavian, um, a graduate student at Columbia, uh, you know, has been spearheading this project. So basically, the question we're asking is, can we use some of the implications, some of the results from, uh, you know, the, the model with uh, Linda in the real world? And uh, can we connect these population level parameters that we were kind of thinking about homophily and consolidation to real life diffusion outcomes? So that's the question. And the outcome that we have in mind is migration. And um, so it's easy to think about migration as an economically motivated decision. People move to do better, but we also know that migration can be a social diffusion process. So it's easier for me to migrate if I know other migrants, I can learn about jobs, I can learn about how to cross the border, and it's ex more acceptable for me to migrate if a lot of people in my community are migrants. So my social ties can provide both resources like information and help, and also normative influence that facilitate migration. So in this way, people have argued, researchers have argued that past migration can become a catalyst for future mobility. So this is the well-known cumulative causation theory of migration. And, um, but we in, in, when we look at real life data, we see that this is not always a linear process. And actually there's quite a bit of variation or inequality in the diffusion of migration. So let's take the Mexico US case. So migration started in the central Western states in Mexico, not along the border, so far from the border, because those states were connected to the US early on via railroads in the early 1900s. So recruiters, employers from the US use the railroads to go to the cities and rural areas in Mexico and then bring back workers to the US. But those states are not necessarily the highest migration states right now. In fact, there's quite a bit of a variation in how much migration has grown across states. So this figure is basically making that point. The x-axis shows us the percentage of US migrants from a state, um, basically what share of that state has migrated in 1925. And the y-axis is showing the same percentage in 1985 from our own data. So 1925 data is coming from historical archives. So the line here we see is the slope uh, that is given by a simple regression of 1985 rates on the earlier rates. And then we see that states on average have experienced a 20-fold increase in their out-migration over um, 60 years. But the rate of increase actually varies across states. So we see that six states are enjoying larger than expected increases in migration, given this linear model. And there are states that are above the 95% bands, like gray bands um, uh, here. And then six states actually experience lower than expected increases. So these are the ones that fall below that band. Now we can ask, why is there this variation? And does the structure of social ties in these communities, can it explain the variation in the diffusion of migration? Again, we're back to this line of thinking that I've been pushing off, um, you know, in, in this talk. Basically, we're saying that network structure would affect diffusion of a practice and also inequality in the diffusion of that practice. And the practice we have in mind is migration and intergroup inequality is the variation in migration prevalence across communities. Now, the big problem here, and then in many questions in sociology is that we don't have data on the network structure. And migration is already very hard to measure, you know, because it's a mobile population. If we add to that, the difficulty of capturing social ties of this mobile population. So it's, it's no surprise that we lack good data sources on that, but is there a way to get around this problem? Now, my talk up to this point was all about how homophily and consolidation can shape network structure. So basically the question that we're asking here is, can we use these parameters instead of network data? In other words, can these parameters give us a sense of 
what the connectivity of network would be like. And this is the basic premise of the analysis here. So the data come from the Mexican Migration Project. And um, the, the project surveyed 161 communities sometime between 1982 and 2018. Basically, each community was surveyed in a different, more or less different year. So every year they surveyed four or five communities. And in each community, they canvassed the entire community and randomly selected 200 households. And they collected retrospective life histories on everyone in the household, you know, including absent migrants. And they also did some data collection in the US following up the migrants, but most of the data comes from Mexico, the origin communities in Mexico. So basically we have retrospective life history data from about 120,000 individuals. And we use the retrospective information to create a panel data set with over 2 million person years that covers the period from 1965 to 2018. Now, our key measures are here, homophily, consolidation, and migration prevalence. And each are kind of tricky to measure, and um, homophily especially. So researchers actually distinguish between two different kinds of homophily. One is based on choice. So I actively go out and seek people who are like me. And this is how we defined homophily in the agent-based models. We gave people some rules to interact with people. And the other kind of homophily can be induced. For example, if I attend an elite school that selects on socioeconomic characteristics, as a result of that, my friends would resemble me, but this homophily is induced, not based on my choice. In real life networks, we know that homophily is both on, based on both choice and induced. And here we don't have actual network data, so we have no idea about choice homophily, but we can offer a proxy for induced homophily based on population composition. In other words, who are the community members um, that you're exposed to? And to underscore this difference uh, that we're only focusing on induced homophily, we use the term homogeneity here rather than homophily. So to capture homogeneity, we consider six characteristics that matter to migration decision as well. Again, we're looking for things that matter to both network formation and also adoption of the practice. And we select six of them, age, education, income, and three wealth measures that measure your value of your land, the properties you have, and whether you have any other business in Mexico. And then we standardize each of these measures to a zero one range. And then for each pair of individuals, we have to compute a measure of social distance to determine how similar they are on these six attributes. And to do that, we kind of select a very simple way. We take the difference in each dimension, square it and add it all up. So it's a Euclidean distance. And then we take the mean of all pairwise social distances in a community, because we want to capture at the community level, what does this look like? How similar are people to one another in that community? And then we take the complement of this value. So the higher the measure, higher the homogeneity in the community. So to measure consolidation, remember consolidation is about correlation between characteristics. We compute the pairwise correlations among six characteristics, and then we take the mean value. And there's surprisingly a lot of variation across communities in these two measures. So here, the figures here showing are showing the distribution of homogeneity and consolidation in our data. And both indicators are theoretically between zero and one. But we see immediately here that we don't observe the full range in our data. So homogeneity varies between somewhere from 0.2 to 0.6. Consolidation is 0.05 to point like three, four, but like probably just one community with that uh, accounting for that long tail. Now, this is different from the simulations that we did where we could see the full range zero to one. So just as a caveat, we should not expect to observe the same kind of curvilinear relationship here because we don't have the full range in the real data. We'll probably see a smaller segment of the expected relationship here. Okay, so we have homogeneity consolidation. We also wanna know about how prevalent migration is in a community, how diffused migration is as a practice. And to measure that, we use a percentage of individuals who have ever migrated in a community year. Again, there's quite a bit of variation in communities. So by the survey year, in some communities, 60% of the people in our data have migrated at least once. In other communities, less than 5% have migrated. Again, we see this, um, this range in the data. But again, we don't see the range from zero to one, right? Okay, so our hypothesis here 
based on the simulations is that middling levels of homogeneity and consolidation at the community level will be associated with the highest effect of community migration prevalence on individual migration. In other words, the diffusion would be strongest at these kind of ideal ranges of homogeneity and consolidation. Of course, all else equal. So to test this hypothesis, we estimate a logic model of whether a person makes an um, US trip in any given year. And then to measure homogeneity and consolidation, we realize we're not measuring this by any means precisely. So instead of using continuous measures, we created three bins of low, medium, and high. And they are, they're equal size bins based on frequencies in our data. And same thing with consolidation, we have three levels. And then migration prevalence, we can measure more precisely because we know exactly each person has migrated. So we use that in continuous form. We introduce both linear and quadratic terms for that. And then we in include interactions, three-way interactions, which are a pain to interpret, but with the homogeneity, consolidation, and prevalence. And then we also include fixed effects for state um, year. We have you know, a whole slew of uh, you know, individual level controls like age, education, and all of that. Okay, so how do these kind of three key parameters work? So here we're looking at marginal probabilities of taking a first US trip. That's on the Y axis. And the X axis is community migration prevalence. So how many people or what share of the population has already migrated in that community? And the markers are showing us different levels of homogeneity. The so circle indicates low homogeneity communities. That's the lightest shade of gray. Diamond marks medium homogeneity and triangle is high homogeneity communities. And the dashed lines are confidence intervals, 95%. So we see that at all levels of homogeneity, the relationship between migration prevalence and first migration is nonlinear. So kind of, let's kind of look at it in more detail. Um, so the probability of making a first US trip is increasing linearly with migration prevalence until about a fifth of the community population has migrated at least once. And this happens at all levels of homogeneity, right? So the more people in your community who've migrated, the more likely you are to migrate yourself. Here, the homogeneity in your community does not seem to make any difference in the initial diffusion of migration. But homogeneity does make a difference in later phases, specifically in when diffusion peaks in a community. So let's kind of start with the high homogeneity communities. These are the black triangles here. The probability of first migration as a function of migration prevalence begins to drop when about a fourth of the community population have migrated. So this is where the kind of vertical line is marking and then the probability kind of declines. So you're reaching saturation at this level when about one in four have migrated and then the diffusion really slows down. If we look at low homogeneity communities, this is the light gray circles. Here, the probability of migration continues to increase until about half of the population have migrated. So at a, it's happening at a later stage. So the diffusion is sustained for longer. And if we look at the middle homogeneity communities, it falls somewhere in between. But the differences between low and medium homogeneity communities are not statistically significantly different. So the confidence bands are overlapping, but the high homogeneity communities seem to be, you know, following a different regime. Mercedes? Yes. Can I ask a question? Uh, could you remind me whether um, the, the population sizes differ between these Community? groups? Because yes, between the communities, because if it's, um, um, yeah. if it's a very homogeneous um, community, but ideally, I mean, they, they would be smaller normally, right? If they're super homogenous. Um, yeah, no, yeah. that's a great question. So um, here, because of the sampling, like the way sampling was done, every community has about 200 households. So it's fixed. But I think your question is really important because some of these communities are small. So 200, like there are communities that have, let's say 1000 households. And I've visited some of these communities. So they're really tiny. So you can assume that everybody knows each other well. So then this homogeneity that we're capturing, you know, is, is really reflecting the community at large. And most of these communities are smaller rural communities. But then they're also kind of urban areas. And the way they did it in urban areas was to select the neighborhood or one street because the urban areas are so dense and then still kind of... Um, pick 200 households to interview and they were strategic in selecting these neighborhoods um, they wanted to select areas where 
we know migrants to live. Uh, you know, so I think we've we've tried this yeah. with kind of rural versus urban separation, but like uh, haven't made much sense of the results yet. But I think that's really a key point. Because yeah, right. with, the, with the homogenous one, it really seems like there's some kind of like diminishing returns to, to exactly. scale in a way, kind exactly. of. Um, exactly. I'm sorry, I opened, I think, the question box. Yeah. So there are two Perfect. other questions. Perfect. Uh, Adele first and then yeah, Sam. Sorry, again, it relates to such a uh, question. So basically, uh, just wrapping my head around the data structure. So, so how is community defined here? What, was there like a predefined yeah. unit here that we're looking for? Uh, that, that's the first question. And second, just a simple one, which is that, is this a cross-sectional data or are we following communities over time? Yeah, great question. So, okay. So communities are defined, like, again, it's like, if it, most of the communities are tiny villages called ranchos, like really small villages, because initially Mexican migrants would come from you know, rural areas uh, in Mexico, and they would do agricultural work in the US. So, um, so it, let's say half of these communities fit to this. So basically you drive in, you can almost see the entire community by looking at it. Um, you know, the, you, you can see the households and then there this canvassing and selecting communities is straightforward. But then in later years, we see migration diversifying. So people more and more migrating from urban areas. So the sampling, Remember, sampling started in the 1980s, and their goal was to first kind of just go to four communities and interview those communities. But then they kept getting funding for the project, and every year they would sample different communities, oh, and about four every year. Uh, and this is still ongoing. So we're in 2022 now. They're still kind of adding new communities uh, to the data. In later years, they decided to go to urban communities. So basically, the composition of your data is changing over time because more communities are being added. And in some communities, like this 200 households is, is a great strategy, but again, it's like urban neighborhoods, it's a different thing. Um, so, uh, so that's the first thing. The other thing is, in, it's, data are collected cross-sectionally, it's like a repeated cross-section, but then you ask retrospective life histories of everyone. So when was your first migration? When did you buy your house? When did you buy your land? So you can basically project it backwards in some ways, but then you're making this key assumption that the same people were there you know, many years ago. And then right. we try to kind of control for that by looking at the, adding a control for how many years has it been since survey, things like that. Uh, but it's basically a retrospective um, uh, it's a pseudo panel, I would say. We create a panel data set, but it's not really um, tr a true panel. Right. And you use also year fixed effect to sort of- We use year fixed effects and state fixed effects. Right. Um, yeah. And okay. also kind of rural, urban, like there are controls for that, but yeah, it's not, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so my question is, or maybe you're going to uh, discuss this right now, but uh, I find very interesting that um, uh, that the maximum that the maximum uh, probability of first migration itself scales inversely proportional to the homogeneity of the community. Do you have uh, an interpretation for that, or uh, so say more? So um, so in low homogeneity communities, the probability is higher. Is that what you're? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Uh, you know, here also kind of, I worry about a little bit about low homogeneity communities because you see how large the confidence intervals get. So it means that there are few uh, observations that have high migration prevalence that are also kind of low homogeneity. So I think there's also kind of uh, that issue there. So I'm just like hesitant to make a big deal out of like these magnitudes. Uh, but the only thing that we can see here and in the next figure that I'm gonna show is like that there is a difference between highest homogeneity communities in our sample and then everyone else. So, but uh, yeah, I need to think about um, uh, that more. And also kind of one of the things that is a little bit uh, I find frustrating is that even when you kind of observe these patterns and then you have the theory that we developed in the agent-based model, we don't know the mechanism through which this is working. Like the way we define hom homogeneity is very particular to these characteristics. So what are we capturing about, you know, how interactions are shaped around these characteristics? So I think there's that part that is missing uh, in this analysis, although kind of it's in intriguing to observe 
this and to see that some of the patterns that you would expect, some of the nonlinearities that you would expect are emerging out of the data. There's still that part of like, how is this happening? What is happening? And why did these communities become homogenous in the first place is the big question. Or why did these communities become consolidated in the first place? I think those are kind of some of the things that we can't really explain here. Anyway, uh, let me continue. Almost done. Uh, sorry, this is like a super long talk. So basically what we find is um, low and medium levels of homogeneity at the community level seems to correspond to kind of higher effects of community migration prevalence on individual migration, exactly what you know um, Samuel was talking about. And this pattern is in line with both kind of Blau and Schwartz and kind of Santola. It's not exactly matching Santola because we see no differentiation between low and medium level homogeneity, but then remember how we defined uh, uh, you know, low, medium, and high homogeneity, and how kind of we're bound by our data. We don't observe zero homogeneity communities in our data. We don't also observe perfectly homogeneous communities in our data. So in the Santola experiments, we were observing this full range. So basically what we call low homogeneity does not capture lowest of the low, you know? Uh, so maybe kind of that's what's explaining um, that discrepancy. Now let's look at consolidation how diffusion varies by levels of consolidation. And remember, consolidation is based on correlations among different individual traits in a community. Again, we have the marginal probability of taking a first trip on the y-axis, and then x-axis is community migration prevalence. And the markers here are different groups of consolidation across communities. Again, if we look at the initial phases, we see more or less a linear effect, like the more people who have migrated in your community, the more likely you are to migrate. And uh, there's not variation by level of consolidation. It doesn't make a difference. But then in later phases, we see some differentiation. So we see that the probability is increasing more steeply with rising prevalence in high consolidation communities. In other words, there's some initial advantage that comes from a highly consolidated community where it thing diffuses really, really fast. And, but then in later phases, this advantage basically disappears. It's like you have a steep, downhill going on. If we also look at when diffusion peaks, again, it peaks earliest in the high consolidation communities. The peak is sustained a lot longer in low consolidation communities, and then the middling levels fall somewhere in between. But again, it's hard to draw conclusions given how much the confidence bands overlap here. Now, but what I kind of take away from this is that at uh, Again, the, there's some initial advantages to consolidation at initial phases, but that then uh, dies out later on. And this is again, somewhat uh, you know, fitting given what we would expect. But again, it's like we're bound by the range of our data. We're not exactly replicating what Santella had found. Okay, so what about inequality? And here kind of, uh, we're just in the preliminary stages of kind of developing this idea and take the results with a grain of salt because we're just developing them. So basically we, with Paul, we argued that homophily increases inequality all else equal. With Linda, we revised that statement and show that it all depends on consolidation. So if we, ex we apply this logic to this case, we would expect that under high consolidation, like you know, in the experiment with Paul, homogeneity would amplify between community variance in migration prevalence. So it would kind of blow up existing differences even more. And so basically imagine that there are 10 communities all have high consolidation. And if we assume that five of them are high homogeneity, five of them are low homogeneity, we would expect the variance to be in migration prevalence to be higher in high homogeneity communities. So basically high homogeneity would uh, make initial positions more important in determining the final outcome. So one can almost imagine a bimodal process where some communities would settle on a high migration equilibrium, other communities would be left behind. Okay, under low consolidation, we would expect homogeneity to reduce between community variants. So we would expect the opposite pattern. So how do we test these hypotheses? Again, I don't think this is like the right way necessarily, but what we did was we, again, categorized communities into three by three groups by homogeneity and consolidation. We computed the Gini in migration prevalence within each group, and then we regressed the Gini on group and year dummies. Very preliminary, but we basically did not find support for the first idea that under high consolidation worlds, homogeneity would amplify differences. 
we did not see much of a difference, but we found some evidence that under low consolidation, homogeneity, actually increasing homogeneity, reduces between community variants. But again, this is like um, aggregating data so much that I'm not sure kind of how to interpret the results. But if we go back to the original puzzle, I showed you this figure where some communities were below expectation in terms of migration growth, other communities were above expectation. Can we use this theory to explain the original puzzle? And here, basically, we're doing the same analysis, same regression. We're using past migration as a predictor of future migration. And then uh, we're also including homogeneity and consolidation indicators. And each of these states are, this is like predicted versus observed. We see that kind of many of these communities, once we account for these differences, fall closer to the expected uh, or predicted line. So basically the takeaway here is that this cumulative causation idea works. Past migration can be a predictor of future migration, but the social structure as we capture by homogeneity and consolidation seems to kind of help the theory do better in explaining this. Okay, sorry, it was just so long, but here's the takeaway. So we've given a lot of attention in sociology to homophily as a mechanism for network formation and also diffusion, but consolidation is, I believe, an overlooked and equally important factor in network formation and diffusion. And uh, Blau and Schwartz uh, argued that low homophily and low consolidation were the ideal world where everybody would be connected and things would diffuse and there would be cohesion. But uh, we argue that they were not entirely right. Homophily is not all bad. It can actually help diffusion and even alleviate inequality when consolidation is low by giving the network uh, some structure. And then the most exciting part, which I hope Linda will continue to work on is, even when we don't have network data, if we could somehow show that these parameters explain some patterns in the network structure reliably, then we can use kind of sociodemographic surveys to compute these parameters and use them as a proxy for certain aspects of networks. So the data set that Linda is using now, have they have both kind of sociodemographic characteristics and also network data. So one idea is to see what these parameters capture in real life networks. So I'm hoping that she'll continue uh, to work on that. But thank you so much for sitting through and I'm looking forward to hearing more of your thoughts. Thank you so much for this. This was a great presentation.